Well, 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 everybody, thank you for uh, being with us. Let me tell you, I am super excited about my next guest. Um, it's going to be a really cool interview. I've uh, done some cool research um, on my next guest. I know everybody's going to really enjoy this. So my next guest is the general manager of the Australian Timber Importers Federation, um, Inc., which is called uh, ATIF in brackets, so, which is a, the peak national body representing the business interests of timber and wood-based products. Um, importing and wholesaling uh, companies. So there's, you know, we've got local, obviously, timber, and then there's imported timber. Um, ATIF represents and advocates, uh, you know, for the importing sector of the timber industry in uh, national fora. He's also the CEO of Forest Lands Consulting that specialises in temperature and tropical forest management, which I've no doubt I'm going to ask questions on, um, which is forest-based timber processing and related marketing and advocacy welcome to the show thank you uh you know john halkett welcome to the show yeah thanks very much nick i think i can just about go and have a cup of coffee you've just about covered the field mate so uh, pretty much so yeah, right it's yeah. uh yeah look, like, we don't need to ask any more questions that's <laughs> it you've, you've got the pedigree yeah i appreciate uh, your time and uh yeah it's uh um looking forward to having a bit of a chat with you Thank you, John. So, John, tell me, I'm, I'm really interested in, first of all, finding out about um, the, you know, the ATIF. I know you and I spoke uh, uh, quite a few months ago and, um, you know, you gave me some background, but just for the, you know, people that are watching this or listening to this um, show, can you tell me a little bit about ATIF? You've been involved with, you know, for quite some time, just a, you know, a snapshot of what ATIF does and, you know, what it means to the overall, uh, you know, um, sector in Australia. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I mean, I, I guess it starts off by understanding supply chain. So uh, there's, a, there's a substantial building and construction industry in Australia, as you know, and they have a range of product inputs of which timber products are one. And ATIF really represents the wholesaling importing part of that supply chain. So it's all a big um, wholesaling uh, and importing companies right across Australia and most states. Um, we, we're responsible for about 90% of the wooden building products, so that solid wood, panels, plywood, you name it, to get imported into Australia. I guess what's, um, from my perspective, what is uh, encouraging, but also a little bit disappointing is that in the wake of, of course, the bushfires that we've had in Australia, and I'd like you to have in the future, but uh, in, the, in the wake of the bushfires, of course, and the loss in terms of, say, pine plantations of about 40% of the volume in southern New South Wales, and the challenges of getting those areas uh, replanted and, and new investment, um, but at the same time, a, a buoyant and progressive uh, building and construction sector, um, we're going to need uh, uh, a lot more product to be imported. So that's where I, I come in and where the companies that I represent, we deal with uh, suppliers all around the world who supply both the structural products that build houses and so on, and some of the decorative uh, hardwood products that go into furniture doors and windows and so on. So increasingly in the future, we're going to see a lot more uh, imported uh, wooden products, particularly the more sophisticated end, products like cross laminated timber that people may have heard about that's now used to build high rise uh, buildings. It's really uh, precast concrete made out of timber. Mm. Most of that product uh, comes into Australia from, from Europe and that's going to be an increasing product line in the future um, as we continue to support the building and construction sector, Nick. Yeah, so how much of our, in a percentage, how much of our timber is imported versus locally sourced? Yeah, that's a that's a, a good point, and and roughly at the moment, probably about twenty percent is imported. So it's not a, a huge volume, but that volume is increasing. For example, in that in the framing in the for house framing, that's the old uh, stick building or what you might know as four by two. Four by two. Yep, that's yeah, all. that 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 uh, product line has been increasing by around about seventeen percent per mm. year for the last five years. So there's an increasing uh, demand for a range of products and that's one of them and that particular product line has been quite badly impacted by the, the fires and the pine plantations right across Australia particularly 
southern uh, New South Wales um, yeah. 19, 20, 2019, 2020 uh, bushfire season. And, and with the, uh, just a quick question, with the um, timber that's imported, is the product already ready for sale or because it's, and, and, and here's, here's why I'm, I'm asking this question. Most people associate the trade and construction industry with, you know, concrete and steel and, and tiling and all of that stuff where they really not, it's not as much as, it is with timber, where timber's in everything in, in our houses, right? Yeah. So, um, and that's why I'm, I really want to educate kind of the viewer and, and the listener on this, just to understand how this whole process works. Or is it is it a raw material, then we process it here, or is it all already pre-processed and then it's, you know, ready for the shelf, so to speak? Yeah, yeah good, Nick. Look, I think you need to sort of up, update yourself a bit. I think the 20th century was probably the century of concrete. Yeah. First century is likely to be the century of timber. Now, yeah. one of the reasons for that, of course, is that we're all concerned about climate change, and the timber is the only building material which is, uh, I guess, congealed CO2. So it uh, it takes uh, when you were back at school, Nick, and, and if you can recall back doing your biology and talking about photosynthesis. Yes. Um, wood is uh, is made out of uh, CO2 and, and water and a bit of energy from the sun. So. The use of wood is really climate change friendly um, and you're going to see increasingly as we are more sophisticated engineered products going into high rise buildings and there's been a shift in Australia from detached homes to apartments and a lot of those apartments now are being built not of precast concrete panels but of timber panels. Yeah, Just yeah. getting back to the point you made about compliance, that's one of the big areas that I spend a lot of my time on. And it's been difficult during COVID because a lot of the timber importers, of course, travel to talk to their suppliers to make sure that the product that they're going to import is fit for purpose. Now, what does that mean? It means that it has to comply with the Australian building codes and standards. So it's got to be machine graded. It's got to be stamped. It's got to be tested. In addition to that, you've got to make sure that there's a whole raft of other regulations that relate to phytosanitary or to quarantine or to illegal logging. And it's important for importers to be confident that uh, the product they import, as you say, when it goes on the shelf, it's fit for purpose, it's ready to go. And we're having those discussions um, at the moment with a number of new suppliers out of North America and out of Russia. Uh, I'm, I was supposed to go to St. Petersburg to have a discussion with the Russians and have lunch with Vladimir Putin. But uh, of course, COVID's come along and uh, upset those plans at the moment. Upset those plans. So, so tell me, John, uh, because this is just uh, uh, such an interesting topic. Where do we sit here in Australia versus globally where it comes to, um, you know, building with these, you know, natural materials? And, and um, once again, you know, just forgive my ignorance. To me, I think, um, you know, forestry is kind of what you see, obviously, on, you know, documentaries and TV, forestry is just becoming, you know, tough and we need, you know, the lungs of the planet. I, I want to set this up. You know, I was doing some research um, about you and I came across your, your blog site, to, um, Talking Trees. So if there's anybody that's good, that's an advocate of, of sustainability and, and just everything where it comes to, you know, trees and, and wood, it's you. So that the, the pedigree is there already. I'm trying to understand where we are because I know in certain um, aspects um, from around the world, we some, we lag sometimes. And the reason I say that is I've been in Asia uh, a lot and um, even in me seeing them, uh, you know, uh, in construction like scaffolding, they're using bamboos rather than steel. They're using a lot of different materials that I haven't really seen as much here in Australia. And we're still using kind of a, a brick or a concrete slab as a panel. And so I'm wondering if you can just, you know, help me out here and just to enlighten me a little bit on where we sit with this, whether we're leading or we're lagging or things are changing. So. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine, Nick, you on a bamboo scaffold somewhere in Bangkok or somewhere, you know. Oh, yeah, it'd be a challenge. <laughs> it'd be a challenge. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a good question. And of course, um, I'm a tree guy, so trees are my thing. And I think one of the things that really encouraged, encourages me into this industry is that if you can make trees and forests valuable, they get uh, looked after and retained. If people think they're not valuable, they clear them and put in palm oil or they... they yeah. 
So you've you really got to make trees valuable and forests valuable. So, of course, in this area of um, climate change, whole issues around valuing uh, the carbon that's stored in the trees to offset against against emissions in terms of emissions trading schemes, which Australia has been on about for some years, but hasn't quite got there yet. It's all important. But certainly in Eastern Australia, um, in Australia generally, there is a tradition on building in wood. Brick veneer houses are all wooden framed. And, and also uh, with some of the modern materials. Now, Sydney, in, in global terms, is second only behind Vancouver for the number of high-rise buildings. These are buildings that are in the sort of uh, nine to 30 uh, story level that are now being built out of timber. For example, the new Barangaroo International House is, is a timber building, and there's a lot of buildings which have products, as I said, like cross-laminated timber and a whole range of other engineered products. So certainly Australia has a strong tradition, and of course, um, right back at colonial times and even today, people love their hardwood floors, their black butts, their spotted gums, their jarras, their carries, their tassie oaks, their Victorian ash, and those, those products are produced in Australia out of sustainably managed and certified forests. Yeah, yeah. There's a gap in the supply chain, as I said, with the around about 250, 300,000 housing starts a year in Australia and a strong build in additions and alterations with the demographics pre-COVID uh, uh, suggesting an increased population here. The building and construction sector is really uh, strong. It's strong in terms of employment, its contribution to the economy. And certainly in terms of uh, import products, timber products are important. And uh, part of the importer's role in ATIF is to ensure that uh, the building and construction sector is, uh, is supplied. I occasionally get a, a phone call from some guy on a 30 story level of a building in Sydney say, hey mate, I'm, we can't get any form ply. What's going on? And I say, well, uh, there's an issue with China, for example, at the moment, or someone else. So really, the building products are critical to construction and and building, and uh, we see that as also contributing to trying to offset some of the adverse impacts on climate change. So we we prefer mm -hmm. to see timber products used rather than some of the high energy products. And you mentioned concrete, steel, aluminium, which uh, have a lot more what we call embedded energy in their manufacture than timber. So certainly I think you'll see that trend continue and accelerate into the future. But Nick, just keep off that bamboo scaffolding and bang Keep off the bamboo scaffolding. <laughs> it's amazing how they do that. It's like a, it, it defies me. I remember being in Hong Kong and, you know, the bamboo scaffolding came over the top of the street where there's people and there's all of this traffic underneath. Here they would have blocked off. But those guys have 50, 50 kilos, Nick, and so they, they can hang up. Exactly. Yeah, they're not like me after oh. Christmas. Yeah, um, I was I was really I suppose excited when I I researched uh, your blog site Talking Trees, um, and I read a really interesting fact about a tree, right, and how it grows, and I was wondering if you can share that with the lister, and also just the premise around the site itself because. I'd, I'd really like to know a bit more about your background. I mean, why trees? Why is it so, it sounds like this is your life. It's been your life. And I always like to know the person behind this. You're an advocate. If you can explain what a tree is, it's really, 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 really cool. Coming from your words rather than mine. Is, is, well, is, I've is, had a, an interest in trees, Nick, and I guess it goes back to when I was younger. I could never run fast enough to catch the girls, but I could generally grab hold of a tree. <laughs> uh, I've always been in the tree space. I did a, I worked uh, initially a, in, in forestry as a forest ranger in New Zealand, and I then went to university and did a honours degree in forest science. And I worked and done postgraduate work in the US and also in public policy. So, and I got involved in the forest industry uh, in New Zealand and in Australia, really in government forestry activity, and since. Um, you know, 2002 or thereabouts, I set up my own consulting company, Forest Lands Consulting. And under that umbrella, I do a number of activities, including act as general manager for the Australian Timber Importers Federation. But I think when you look at trees, and I, I said, I, 
I mentioned before, I've written a number of books on trees. I'm into my seventh book now, which is with the publisher. And I think trees are really fascinating. I mean, most of the products, whether it's tires on your car or the pills you take for your, um, for your headache or um, the products that we use day to day, the coffee that we drink, they all come from plants and notably from trees. So uh, our, our civilization and society going back to olive oil in the time of the Greeks and Romans all comes from trees. And I think trees are incredibly important to sustain our lifestyle and also important that we manage forests so that we can utilize um, the, some of the unknown uh, products that are still in forests uh, in the future for, for a range of activities which, uh, which benefit uh, humankind. I think in that context, it's really important we look after the forest and it, there's little point in my view at locking up forests and saying, it's going to be a reserve and no one can go in there. We've really got to make forests valuable and um, I know that uh, Greg Hunt, when he was the environment minister speaking at, uh, in Southeast Asia, talked about the, the forest that pays is the forest that stays. So if you can get a product like carbon out of a forest, if you can sustainably harvest fruit or timber or fodder, people will look after those forests. And also, by the way, they happen to contain a whole range of, uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, elephants and tigers and orangutans and so on. Now, if those forests are cleared, all those animals disappear. So mm -hmm. part of the work that we do with the importers is to make sure that the timber products that we import are sustainably um, managed, legally sourced, a fit for purpose, valuable, contribute to building and construction in Australia. And by doing that and working with the supply countries, we can help to ensure that forests are healthy. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the basis upon which I, in my spare time, Nick, because I can't catch the girls, I write a blog, I write a tree blog, and I do that on a regular basis. I love it. I, I find to me, I feel that trees are the custodians of this planet. They've been here for a long time. And, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're They've got a life of their own, just like we have. Right? It's pretty, pretty amazing. But I know we could talk about that in, an, in another uh, interview. I'll talk about but, it forever. But a, a couple of useful points, I guess, is that they're the largest organisms on the planet. And some of the large uh, cowries of New Zealand are the the Mount Nashes of, of Victoria and the the uh, the, the red red uh, redwoods of California. And also, they're the oldest. I mean. Some of the trees, uh, yeah. some of the spruce trees in Europe are 9,000 years old. Oh. Um, you know, many, many trees are well over a thousand years old. So they're, the, they're our companions on the planet and they've, and they've been here a lot longer than we have and they'll be around when, when you and I are no longer here. Yeah. Well, um, just, just, just to see what they've seen, you know, it's pretty amazing. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, tell me, what do you think from an importing point of view, a source point of view and sustainability, what do you feel that the next, you know, five to 10 years is going to look like globally? How does that affect Australia? Uh, you know, we're, we're hopefully going to be growing our population again. As you're saying, people are moving from, you know, high energy type, excuse me, materials into, you know, more organic, naturally sourced type materials. And I'm just wondering what you guys see from an associate, association point of view and, you know, how you see the industry changing in the next five to 10 years? I think that's a really good question, Nick, and it's something that we worry about regularly. I mean, the reality in Australia is that we've got to put more effort in Australia into supplying our own timber products. So that means planting more trees, managing forests, uh, I, I guess, more in a more sophisticated way. Um, that's, that's really important so that we can supply an increasing amount of our own timber and forest product needs. If you look globally, there are some real tensions around the supply of wood products. So there's not a great amount of wood that's sitting around there that we can import into Australia because the demand, for example, we have a strong relationship with Canada, uh, but the main Canadian product is across the border in the US. So they say to me, well, why would I send a shipload of wood to Sydney when I can send it to Seattle for the same price? Uh, and also the Australian requirements for compliance are, are, are very are quite demanding and uh, a lot of uh, suppliers think we're too fussy. So working on finding sources of 
supply outside Australia is going to be increasingly challenging. Part of my job is to, is to be to go to play, places like Vancouver and St. Petersburg and, and Jakarta to talk to trade associations in those countries, to talk to suppliers, to, to find out um, <coughs> you know, what, what the possibilities are. But there's certainly no doubt that in the future we are going to have a really challenging situation in relation to supply, particularly of the more sophisticated products uh, that, or the components there are now uh, a number of components. So you can block, buy a flooring system or a wall system or a, a pre-made pre uh, house, for example, and getting those sort of products into Australia is going to be a challenge which is going to involve the building and construction sector talking to the supply chain to see how we can overcome some of these issues. And mm -hmm. that, particularly as you say, post-COVID, if we get back to something like the level of import uh, of immigration we had before, and we see housing starts push up towards 300,000 a year, and we'd rather use timber than steel and concrete because of its environmental and its climate change attributes. So we really need to find ways of supplying the timber products to that industry um, in the future. And that'll, that'll be a challenge for all of us, Nick. With, with, with our Australian environment, and the climate that we have here, um, is it a, a good ecosystem for us to grow um, trees, or is it due to, let's say, the weather's in, the weather in, you know, Canada or the environment or Asia that it's more tropical, so you know, certain trees are, uh, you know, more likely to grow. Is that the reason we're importing more? Just because you know, a we don't have the, I suppose, the the network set up here for it, or is it more just Climatically, it it grows better overseas, and technology-wise, from you know, like you're saying, these more advanced uh, type uh, uh, material setups, you know, is because they're doing it on a larger scale. So economically, it's it's more feasible um, than us doing it here in Australia. So I'm just wondering how, what that environment's like. Yeah, yeah, good, uh, good point, Nick. I mean, the reality is that for trees to grow, they need water. And Australia is a relatively dry continent. Uh, but nonetheless, there are still a lot of land. Australia is a, a large continent and there's lots of land and there's lots of forest. I mean, you've got to break into two halves. The, um, the bushfires that we saw during the, the 2019-2020 summer really impacted on the plantations. So these are pine trees exotic pine trees, radiata pine particularly, um, which is a Californian tree. And that's the basis of the industry that supplies the framing product we spoke about, the plywood. Four by two. The, the four by two. Uh, yeah. the paper to manufacture news, newsprint magazines. That industry, those, that, that resource was very severely impacted by fires. The question in the future is going to be, given the fact we'd like you to see drier weather, um, more bushfires, are there going to be investors out there that have got the courage um, to want to invest in replanting those areas of uh, pine plantations to supply the industry? That's a question. And, and at this stage, the question would probably be answered by saying, well, there's, there's not a lot of appetite for that. But on the other hand, Australia has very substantial areas of native forest of the sort of species we mentioned before, the eastern uh, hardwoods, the turpentines, the ironbarks, the, the black butts, the spotted gum, the Sydney blue gum, those species and across the border into Tasmania, the Victorian ashes and so on. Now there's a substantial resource there that we, that we should be better utilising for our own needs rather than putting pressure on countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea to supply high quality hardwoods, the merbows. If you've, if you've got a deck, it's probably got a merbow timber on the top of it. Yeah. Um, so there needs to be more effort. And unfortunately, native forests management in Australia is often caught up at a state level with politics so that that um, some sometimes uh, there's a political advantage to transfer areas of productive forest to national park. We have to do more to better manage our native hardwood forest to supply our needs, but also we have to try and see how we can make putting money into pine plantations more attractive. And one aspect of that 
neck in relation to climate change is to see uh, owners of pine plantations being able to sell the carbon that's stored in the trees. I mean, uh, just a, a little bit of arithmetic, just to just just to keep you interested. If you look at a, a pine plantation, say around Tuma Tumbarumba, it has a productivity of about 25 cubic meters of biomass per hectare per year. So of that, about 12 ton of that biomass is carbon. Now carbon. Um, is traded in the emissions trading schemes around the world and various places in Europe. And it's selling at the moment for over $20 a tonne. So every year, that plantation is going to, it's going to have every hectare, 12 tonne of carbon at $20 a tonne. What's that, $120? And if you've got 50,000 hectares of pine plantation, and you can sell that carbon as an offset, for example, to a manufacturing operation has to get its emission levels down. You can sell the carbon as a, as a carbon offset. That's so there's a, a number of policy areas that I think can make plantation investment more attractive, but also, of course, the the near and present risk of further bushfires. And there's been, you know, royal commissions and and, and other inquiries into the into the bushfires. We need to do more to reduce the threat of climate change and to better prepare areas to. Uh, to defend them against bushfires. Yeah, I, I really like the uh, philosophy of, you know, if you make it valuable, people will care for it. And, yeah. and, you know, we're starting to see, as you're saying, it's not necessarily just the timber itself that makes you a profit, it's the carbon that makes the profit at that, you know, it still keeps the prices good on, on the timber itself. Yeah. I think we've seen this with, you know, ecosystems like uh, the Great Barrier Reef. You know, if we care for it, you know, we look after, we make ecotourism something that's, you know, sustainable. Obviously, there's, there's opportunity for us. I'm really excited about the fact that, you know, there's custodians just like yourself that are passionate about, you know, being in this um, industry. And for me, I suppose, uh, from a business point of view, I wanted to just, uh, you know, I'm aware of time, so I've got a few more questions, but I, 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 I just wanted to find... Now, from your point of view, people that are, you know, in the business of timber, that are on sellers, wholesalers, re, you know, uh, resellers of, you know, the imported timbers, um, what do you say to them, you know, in the next three to five years? What changes do they need to be aware of? What is it that they, you know, I'm going to use the plant, plant the seeds today, you know, it'll grow into a flourishing you know, tree that'll keep on giving back and back and back. Because I think if we really look, you know, humans are really good at looking in hindsight, but we never really see some of the signs that we need to. Just like you're saying, the bushfires maybe at some levels could have been avoided if better care was placed on that. You know, so I'm just wondering what you see from a, how do you make business savvy effectively in your industry? I think, guess the first thing, uh, Nick, is you've got to have some patience because trees don't grow um you know, overnight. So it's, it's a long-term business that needs long-term goals and long-term investment and, and, a, and a long-term strategy. But certainly I think you've got to look at the marketing as a starting point. What, what does the market need? Where's the market shifting to? And the point I made before about this shift in Australia, which is quite marked now from detached homes, which were traditionally for the last many, many decades have been the way to go to more urban infill, you know, uh, mid to high rise buildings. And that requires a whole different approach in terms of engineering design and products. So, but those products are valuable. So engineered wood products of a range, whether it be plywood or products like LVL, um, laminated veneer lumber or CLT cross laminated timber or a range of other products, components, quite valuable. And those are the products we really wear um, it's opportunities for Australia to manufacture them here in Australia, which we're not doing at the moment. And part of Australia's tragedy, I guess, is that a lot of manufacturing is done elsewhere. And we're finding that at the moment with, uh, for example, with China now not taking a whole range of raw products. I mean, the lesson there is we've got to be making some more products in Australia. But certainly, I think in the terms of the supply chain in the, in the timber industry, it's reasonably segmented. So if you're a, a reseller, if you're a Bunnings or you're a, or you're a tradesperson or you're a builder, you can reasonably rely on the wholesaler to make sure that the product that they are selling you 
is compliant. And if you have questions about the relevant standards, whether it's plywood or whether it's four by two, that it complies with the re requisite um, standard, that it uh, has met the phytosanitary requirements, that it's adequately treated against uh, termites or dry, dry rot, that it complies with the illegal logging legislation. That's the sort of work that the Australian Timber Importers Federation does to make sure that the products which are on sold down the chain and finish up in, in your in your nice um, holiday home you've got Nick on the beach there, or um, what else, uh, whatever else building is done that they they comply. So that's that's an important part of the of the equation. Also, there's a lot of work being done in Australia by the industry generally through a, a website called Wood Solutions, which is the most visited technical website in the world that has a lot of information about species, attributes, uses, technical information, span tables and so on that is very popular with designers, architects and specifiers. So they can understand a bit better about the idiosyncrasies of various wood species, which species to use for which particular purpose, where they get those supplies from. So that's all part of the overall push. Well, that's really, really good. I've got two more questions for you, John. Number one, I'd love to know a little bit about uh, your consultancy business. And if anybody's watching this, how do they sort of find out a little bit more about uh, you and the consultancy? And also, how do they get in touch if they you know, want to talk to you uh, with regards to the uh, association as well? So I'm wondering, and I will put this in the show notes and stuff. So, if you, can, you know, just quickly tell me about, you know, what, what the consultancy business does and then how people can get in touch with you for that and the association. So. Yeah, we're starting with the association uh, first, Nick. I mean, it's not a sort of an open door policy. Any company that wants to be a member um, has to have the approval of the board so that we tend to represent the larger um, wholesalers and importers. And we run the Royal Rover companies first and uh, to make sure that they comply with our code of conduct, that they have uh, the requisite uh, requirements in place. But we do welcome uh, approaches from wholesalers and importers because we can support their operations and we do have the capacity, for example, that I can go down to Canberra and I can speak to the Minister for Agriculture um, or other ministers um, about issues that relate to the sector. And I know that I, re I represent the sector, so I can be a voice for companies uh, that are in the, in the wholesaling, uh, importing trade, speak to the government about regulations, about tariffs, about ports, about supply, about trade uh, delegations to, to Canada or to Russia. So that that's there's a benefit there to, for importers and wholesalers to be involved with the association because we represent them at a federal level and we also support them. For example, there's a current issue at the Port of Botany and I'm involved in that with the empty container park. So that's an issue. In terms of my, my consulting, I guess my background is, is, is as a forester. I trained as a forester and, and uh, whilst the uh, Australian timber importing area is in the product end, uh, uh, my background is forest management. So I, I do a, a lot of work in terms of managing forests, both both temperate forests and also particularly in Southeast Asia. I've done a lot of work there on uh, harvesting systems, compliance systems, illegal logging systems, codes of conduct, um, th th that sort of area. So that's uh, an area that I uh, specialize in. Also, I think recently in terms of climate change and renewable fuel, there's been a significant move into biomass to replace fossil fuels. So you're seeing that right across the world in Scandinavia, in Japan, Japan has shifted from nuclear to biomass. There's a trend in Australia as well. So that's another area where you add value to forest because the bits and pieces of a tree that are not of sufficient quality to go into a four by two for your beach house, Nick, um, that they can be chipped and they can go into a power station. And there's one in the Hunter the Valley at the moment that's being, being built. And they can they can supply baseload power um, and replace uh, replace coal-fired power stations. So there's another developing area that contributes to the overall economics of, of, of forestry and forest management practice and, and also contributes to climate change abatement. Pretty amazing. So we'll definitely put that into the show notes. I've got one last question for you, John. 
if you were going to be a tree, which tree and why? I was going to be a tree. Yeah. Well, that's that's a, a good question. I mean, come back to the point you made before. The thing about trees, the trees are plants that just grow tall. And they, they grow tall because they want to race up and get into the sunlight. I guess, um, you know, given that I'm a Kiwi by birth and I worked uh, after graduation in the northern um, cowrie forest of New Zealand, I guess the mighty cowrie tree is, uh, is, is internationally renowned and um, some of them are over 2,000 years old and they've got a girth that, that, that puts you in the shade uh, next to <laughs> So I think where I'd like to be. <laughs> That's such a good answer right there. So, isn't it amazing, right? This, uh, I think in 100 years, we're going to learn so much more about this amazing, uh, you know, uh, custodian. And like you said, just a species that is, uh, it, it's everything for us. It creates the environment, yeah, creates air up. for us to breathe, it gives us shade. We've got it all, Nick. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we need to look after trees. We need, we need more trees in Australia, not less. We need to see investment in plantations. You get carbon, you've got biomass, you've got a whole range of opportunities, plus a whole range of um, liquid uh, products, chemical products out, out of trees now that used to be made out of uh, other fossil fuels. So there's an exciting opportunity for the forest sector, both in Australia and internationally. And that, that, that's what encourages me. So the books that I write tend to cover that sort of ground as well. Fantastic. Well, John, thank you for your time, mate. I, I, I understand time is precious and, uh, you know, we need more people like you on the planet that are, you know, really dedicated their life to the sustainability of, you know, the planet itself and, you know, doing good for business, doing good for Australia. And, uh, you know, I can't thank you enough. Um, we'll have show notes uh, on this as well, uh, on our uh, podcast side as well. So thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, taking the time out to uh, join us today. Yeah, thanks very much, Nick. It's been an honour to talk to you. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I've always uh, been interested in trees and continue to be so, so other people can, can get involved as well. That, that's a good outcome. So thanks very much, Nick. I appreciate it. Thank you.